We are never completely contemporaneous with our present. History moves quietly in disguise. The long shadow of the distant hill, a meandering river, and a half-made road disappearing in the dense foliage. Border posts and Constantina wires that divide people and change the compass of their lives are all evidence of how history reshapes ownership of land and thus destiny of a large mass of people. Wars, partition of lands, search for riches, security, or just plain geography decide what happens to societies. India is not East. Landlocked by history is a case in point of what can go wrong to perfectly stable and affluent societies. Long before the British colonialists occupied the Indian subcontinent, Northeast was one of the richest areas of the region. It had an active economic discourse with its neighbors. Land and river routes were taken to travel to as far as Kashmir. It had traditional links with Nepal, Tibet, and China. History has it that King of Kashmir married the Princess of Kamaru. A homes from Thailand ruled Assam for hundreds of years. In other words, India's northeast was networked and integrated with its neighbors and rest of the Indian mainland culturally and economically. It was a borderless world where people could move freely without fear. After the British occupied India and realized its geostrategic importance, they built barriers between Assam and Bhutan. Also, Burma and Bhutan were created as buffers against the French and the Russians, respectively. Imperial policy resulted in disruption of the traditional trade routes like the Silk Road. Historians believe that this was colonialism's most enduring negative legacy. The British administration felt that the Northeast region should be used as a buffer between uh, British India and the then rulers of Burma. So the kind of incursion that were taking place constantly by the Burmese. So you had to create a buffer. Despite this, Assam and other areas of the Northeast had one of the highest per capita income. Its ample resources like wood, oil, tea, and other agricultural goods, and the ability to trade leavened the standard of living. The northeastern region uh, was a kind of uh, meeting point surrounded by different countries. When India attained independence, when the partition took place, actually the entire northeastern region was reduced to a landlocked cocoon. You know, and all our traditional trade, commerce, the linkages got disrupted. That affected the growth of Northeast. Post-colonial world was chaotic. New barriers were set up to divide rivers, lands, and people. India's Northeast lost both economically and logistically. Wars with Pakistan and communal tensions further severed the old linkages. Before 1947, there used to be a lot of movements of these uh, vessels from Calcutta to uh, Upper Assam here for tea, uh, machineries and soldiers and uh, government officials. They all used to move from Calcutta to here. But after 47, uh, when the East Pakistan and, and, uh, it was made, uh, everything came to a standstill. Both Eastern India and Northeast progress was smothered by a transformed geography. Kolkata, a bustling industrial metropolis, too suffered due to partition. At one time, it was the most significant port in Eastern Asia, but geopolitics devalued its status. Growth of Calcutta is uh, directly linked with the growth of Eastern India and growth of Northeastern uh, India. Calcutta is certainly a gateway towards Northeast, and when we look towards locust policy, Calcutta and then it gets transferred to Guwahati. Fifty years of planned development did not help the Northeast. Almost 50% of the people of East and Northeast live below the poverty line. Insurgency and tribalism took roots in the Northeast. Separatist tendencies began to gain momentum. Xenophobic policies of the central government reinforced by its geographical location prevented setting up of any worthwhile industries. The most important issue is Northeast. 
continues to be one of the least integrated regions in the country. It is not even integrated within the region. For instance, if you a person from Arunachal would know very little about Nagaland. Considering it has huge international boundaries, it must integrate. In absence of integration and cooperation, the only other viable option is conflicts. Due to its geostrategic presence, the government did not really build any industry in these parts. War with China in 1962 built a case for not developing this region. Expectedly, there were very few employment opportunities. It set off a vicious cycle of lack of development and insurgency that further deepened the alienation of people from the central government. Rampant corruption, symbolized by large-scale leakage of government funds by mainland-based contractors, gave central government a bad name. There has been, a, 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 I think, a, a policy mismatch here. It is not enough to pump in money in an economy which cannot absorb. Therefore, in the 50s, when in the government of India pumped in a lot of money to smaller states in order to contain the militancy and the insurgency, uh, they looked at it from the security prism and also from the fact that money would satisfy the people and then they will not raise the slogan of secession. However, uh, that has uh, created several problems of uh, leakages, private agenda, nexus between rulers and the ruled. Slowly, what happens is that, just in the case of all tribal societies, the egalitarian aspect of social ethos got destroyed. There was recognition that development could provide a solution to Northeast variegated problems. Till Cold War ended, competing ideologies prevented Government of India to look beyond its borders to find solution to the problem of poverty and underdevelopment of its Northeastern region. In 1991, Indian government shed much of its Cold War baggage and began putting together the forgotten pieces of an old jigsaw puzzle. Maps of disused road and rail links, old river routes that kept Northeast integrated with rest of India and other countries in its neighborhood were revived. Termed as the Lukis policy, it revisited history to create new paradigms that were based on geography, shared culture, and common religion. The new relationships were based on the belief that opening up of the borders would increase trade and consequently bring prosperity to the region. The Lukis policy did not need enunciation. It was just a restoration of the old order where there were no boundaries. The first step taken by the government was to sign a treaty with Myanmar and explore the road routes that will help in living a dream of connecting with the sprawling landmass of Southeast Asia. The dream of highways that connect Northeast with the rest of Southeast Asia was coming closer to realization. India is very clear that it is going to integrate with Southeast Asia, right? Because of Chinese factor, because of development factors, gains factors. And Southeast Asia also would like to diversify its partners. It doesn't want to be Chinese specific or Chinese centric. It has been so far China centric, right? They would definitely like to have India. So you will find a good response from the any of the economies, you take Singapore, you take Thailand, you take uh, Malaysia, they would like to have a... The only thing is, they are still not very clear, the Southeast Asian countries, whether they, they, whether they should use this route through Northeast. Locust policy is basically a change from our trading practices and investment outlook, which were mostly with the Western world. And the Locust policy is a belated appreciation of the fact that geographically we are part of Asia, that the Asian tigers were the tigers which are visible from India and the western uh, giants are far away. The Lukist policy is a, an understanding of the fact that ethnically we are closer to the Asian tigers and lastly the Lukist policy gives a fillip to trade. The trade is a major mover, has been historically a major mover of the economies in Asia. The 
Look East policy to me seems to be a change in strategy where instead of containment, now we are coming up around to empowering people to be part of India, which I think uh, is a very, very significant change. And it is in this context that if we talk about empowerment of the Northeast and its uh, people, then here is where participatory um, involvement of the people in this whole paradigm shift called the Look East policy can take place. The good thing about this policy is there is uh, uh, attention from all parts of India that we have to do something for the Northeast. Uh, the other part which I would say, I'd say the challenge for us is how do you integrate the Northeast with the mainstream Indian population? A, even in terms of ethnic character, they're different, the social habits are different. And I think uh, a lot of time, a uh, lot of us who are sitting at the policy making end are not aware of the local, um, I'd say sentiments, local culture and we make a one quote fit all type of policy. India's Look East policy was premised on the belief that North East shares 4,500 km long border with neighbouring countries and is joined by just a 37 km corridor with India. Therefore, it made more economic sense to trade with neighbours rather than the mainland. Studies have revealed that carrying goods from different parts of the country made them quite expensive, sometimes to the extent of 60% more. The central government tried to offset these costs through subsidies, but it was a drain on the centre. Reconnecting with the countries to the northeast would not be easy due to difficult topography. Different regions have to be connected through different means of transport. Geography of this region has, is, very, is heavily against us because we have the mighty, mount, the mighty Himalayan mountain just above us. Or to the north of uh, Arunachal, it's the, it's the Tibet, that but the part of China which is totally inhospitable, very sparsely populated. To our east we have uh, Myanmar. Again that, that part of Myanmar is very sparsely populated. They themselves are not very developed uh, regions. Even though China has developed uh, very well, but the part of China which is very close to our borders have not really developed in the sense that they are very thinly populated. So we for us to really go out and reach the developing parts of Southeast Asia, we have to cross a few hundred or maybe thousand kilometers before we uh, get to the real flourishing part of Southeast Asia. This is a huge problem which is, is begging to be addressed in terms of increasing rail, road and air connectivity, in terms of increasing cyber and IT connectivity in terms of increasing power connectivity and in terms of boosting the waterways connectivity which has been there. Connectivity has improved compared to what it was, but not at the pace at which it should have grown. Connectivity within the Northeast also has to improve. Like from Calcutta, you can go to any place, Guwahati, but within Northeast, if one has to go, you have to take the uh, road route, it takes time. That has to improve. Second is connectivity with the neighbors, Bangladesh, Thailand, Myanmar. So that also has to improve. This is an ambitious plan, which is slowly manifesting itself in some ways. Rebuilding the famous 1079 km Stilwell Road is an expression of this vision. The road was built during the Second World War by General Joe Stilwell of the U.S. Army, who decided to build an alternative route to provide relief supplies to the Chinese troops. A technical marvel, the road served the military cause for a few years and then fell into disuse. India is exploring with its neighbors whether this dream bridge between two great nations could be built again. The road between Lido and Assam to Kunming in China has the potential to provide a roadmap of how two great civilizations and economies, China and India, could do business and thus bridge the differences. The Lukis policy is a grand vision that envisages not only seeing Northeast as the entry port to the rest of the Southeast Asia, but also a recipe for the revival of Northeast.
There is a greater clarity in this vision this time, after it was initiated in the early 90s. Aluki's policy could only work if it brought development to the neglected Northeast. This involved not only creating a good network of road and rail connectivity between the Northeastern states, but also establishing trade routes, opening up border check posts, and reviving river routes. In the absence of that, there were fears that the boom in trade experienced by the country would bypass Northeast, as has been the experience for the last 15 years of the Lukis policy, where all the trade took place through sea lanes, benefiting only the ports of Vizag, Chennai, and Kolkata. From this standpoint, reviving old waterways was very important. I will illustrate it by an example that Today, through Chittagong port, for example, 750,000 containers are being handled there. And about 50% of it's originating from or are destined to Dhaka. Now, Chittagong is about 300 kilometers from Dhaka, whereas a far shorter route is available through a place called Naranganj, which is only about 20 kilometers from Dhaka. And Naranganj is very, very close to Cal both Calcutta and Haldia, which are the two dock systems under Calcutta Port Trust. Therefore, with uh, increasing focus on Lok East and with proper upgradation of uh, facilities, the ultimate objective of promotion of trade of commerce with the neighboring countries in this region uh, can very easily be brought about. Agreement with Myanmar on rebuilding the Sitwe port which is 160 kilometers from Mizoram, could give a major boost to Northeast commerce and help in cutting down logistical costs. The Mori Tamu checkpoint was opened at Myanmar in the mid 90s. Although this border point has been in operation for a long time, the border trade is very limited. Other checkpoints and border posts too were flagged off. The biggest and much celebrated point was Nathula, where India and China had fought a bitter war. However, the results here too have not been very gratifying. Look at China. They are trying to bring railway line to Nathula. They brought it up to Tibet, Lhasa. Now they are bringing it to Sigatse, Ganse, and up to Nathula. And what is our reaction? Our reaction is nothing. Right, our road, the, the, the national highway between Sikkim and uh, be, be, that connects Sikkim with uh, the plain areas, it remains disrupted almost six months a year. Right, and how will you trade in Nathula? Now, similar things happen in entire Northeast. The reason why trade has not shown desired results is because of the ambivalence visible amongst administrators about what exactly should be traded between these two countries. For any region to develop, it is important to know your own strengths. The same holds true for Northeast. It has a large mass of English-speaking people that can easily be used in BPOs and the hospitality sector. The ramp up in infrastructure was meant to give meaning to the strengths of this region, which are many. We are good in English-speaking, we are good in IT, uh, uh, Northeast has a tremendous huge electricity uh, generating cap capability and potential which uh, will I'm sure will be very much beneficial to Myanmar and, uh, and, and Bangladesh. Uh, we have uh, coal deposits here, uh, we have uh, so many uh, goods are here and, and so many things that our people have the skills but, the, but because of the, the link is missing so we have not really been able to possibly uh, uh, flourish. It also involved creating an educational infrastructure comprising of colleges, technical institutes and vocational schools that could channelize the youth into productive activities and wean them away from the path of violence. It was lack of opportunities actually basically, you know, there were, there were no good training organizations or institutions available. In the entire Northeast we probably have only about six or seven engineering colleges. North is taken together, you know, for the seven states. Whereas, you know, in a small place like Kerala, if you go, Trivandrum city itself have, uh, has about 12 engineering colleges currently. So that is, you know, Kerala is very far off. I'm citing an example of Kerala, 
which is quite far off and it is not in the main core India. And that is the kind of deficiencies we are having in the Northeast. We would not probably accept this uh, allegation that manpower is not available because the industry is picking up manpower from this region. And every year, at least, uh, I would say four to five thousand uh, students from this region are going out and getting uh, absorbed in BPO industry, software developing industries. But uh, because there is no uh, opportunity in this part, they are not getting accumulated. There, what I will agree is not, there is not a pool of manpower readily available because it is flowing, continuously flowing outside. Had there been industries, there would have been employment opportunities, they would have moved around these industries either being employed or looking for employment. The experience of the last 10 years of Loki's policy has been absorbed by both the central and local governments. There is great emphasis on creation of physical infrastructure to leverage the enormous investment that has been brought to give meaning to the policy. But then because of the central government's policy now, see the infrastructure, there's a sea change. You can see everywhere, not only in Assam, in other states of the northeastern region, the roads are being widened, new roads are being built, which was unthinkable even 10, 15 years back, you know. So, you see, with the uh, lot of investment in infrastructure, obviously the economic activities are generating. For example, I just want to tell you, in the year 2000 in Assam, our economic growth rate was barely 2%, precisely 1.8%. Today, when the India entire country is growing at the rate of 9%, Assam is growing 8.5%, which is something that, you know, it never happened uh, after independence. Though the Northeast remains a stereotype in most people's perceptions, the Northeast is changing. You will realize the Northeast is changing when you see the amount of infrastructure that is being built. Arunachal is taken up hydro projects with a big bang. Sikkim has taken up mini hydro projects in great numbers. Tripura is going through rubber cultivation and rubber plantations, setting up rubber plantations like never before. Tripura is setting up gas-based power plants. The finding of so much natural gas blocks all over the northeast has led to a spurt of economic activity. Mining policies have been relaxed with the result that uh, all over India, companies have a buzz for the Northeast to set up mineral-based activities there. And in the human resources sphere, boys and girls from Northeast are making a mark in hospitality, in tourism, in healthcare, in the BPO segments. So all these economic changes are also impacting the social fabric of the Northeast. However, there are fears that the gains will bypass the Northeast and go to areas that can absorb this growth better. It should not so happen that the Northeast becomes a mere corridor, that goods come from Southeast Asia, traverses through the length and breadth of the Northeast, and goods ends up in Bengal. Northeast has two choices. As, as in one seminar, we heard <coughs> that uh, either you are a uh, segment which is left behind when the flyover. Uh, gets connected from India to North Southeast Asia, or you be a caravan passes along, and uh, you are a passive uh, spectator. I think it is important for us to choose and not to be passive uh, spectators, and we need to do that by becoming a part of the caravan, by deciding what competitive advantage we derive from there, and to do that. The states of the northeastern region who are now advocating or looking at the policy as state specific have to develop a regional perspective and a horizon and vision to make this a single economic unit to derive benefit from that policy.